and another Monday. Here we is, folks. It is uh, what's today's date? What's today's date, uh, Aaron? It's the fifteenth of June. June fifteenth. Uh, very important date. Why? I don't. I don't really know. It's probably because it's five days away from my own birthday. Oh, uh, how about oh. that? Yeah, yeah. Got a the, Father's Day coming the, up soon and a too. Father's Day. So this is a pretty big week. Pretty big week for me. Uh, but welcome to the PWA podcast, episode number twenty-one. Uh, here with you. My name is Emil Williams Jr. and as always joined by Aaron, A. A. Ron Smith and uh, Aaron. First and foremost, man, how's uh, how's your weekend? I know uh, things continue to to kind of open up, obviously, especially in the DFW area. So, how how did things go for you this weekend? A uh, pretty nice weekend. Uh, got to the ITRC again for a couple of games. So, uh, you know, getting ready. Couple ready. games. Are you saying that you actually bowled? Is that what you? I've, I've bowled three straight weekends now. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not here to mess around anymore, folks. But uh, yeah, pr- pretty easy going. Uh, we had some real nice weather, so spent some time outside a little bit as well. Got a little bit of sun, so it's been a while for that. I'm usually, as you know, I'm not an outdoors guy by any stretch. Uh, so that was fun to uh, get to experience uh, the great outdoors of Texas for just a couple of hours. So. Uh, but everything's good here. Hopefully, all is well in Chicago. And why are you still laughing? At me? I, I I don't know because probably I feel this quarantine has really brought some different things out of you. Uh, you're, oh. you're you're back in you know bowling. Obviously, you've been rehabbing an injury as well, so that's that's one thing. And then you've really taken to this outside situation. Uh, so I mean, I'm, I can't wait to see you in person now to to see this new Aaron Smith. <laughs> it's a lot of uh, a lot of expectations, <laughs> but the thing I'm most excited about though is that in like five days you're going to be a year older, and then uh, our numbers won't be the same anymore. So I'm I'm this really excited true. about that part. Yes, so. Father it's Time remains undefeated. <laughs> three months of the year, you are officially older, older than me, even though you're always older than me. But uh, but yeah, that's that's what I got. How about it's you good. guys? Good. Everything was good here. Uh, the weather has been uh, phenomenal. Actually, it was it was chilly, if you will. It was uh, high sixties, low seventies the last couple of days, and uh, this week it should get back into the nineties for a couple of days. So uh, it's been nice to just enjoy some weather, turn the AC off for a little bit, and uh, yeah, have at it. So looking forward to it. I know the weather uh, is always very good, generally speaking, where our uh, next guest is from. <laughs> um, and, and I can always tell that by her jersey designs, which make me just feel so tranquil um, looking for the SoCal sun. Uh, our guest today is Missy Parkin. And to kick off today's show, we will begin with, an, uh, with a clip from mm-hmm. the 2019 Pepsi PWBA Louisville Open. Talk about that. The jersey game is strong with Missy. So. There it is right there. The palm trees, the sky. I mean, it's just... I always look forward to seeing what uh, what jersey Missy is going to wear. Also, dig the uh, the license plate too. There it is. Quest for title number two. Missy's career starts with a strike. Longtime member of Team USA. And the patented smile as well. So, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Missy Parkin to the PWBA podcast. Hi, Missy. How are you? Good. How are you guys doing? We're doing well. Doing I think well. we just yes. just heard our, uh, our our little chat. So you know, Aaron's checking things outside and whatnot, and he's he's hiking and all this other hiking, stuff. Like I, I don't even I don't know, know who the guy I, is. I don't know if I call it hiking by any stretch. It's <laughs> not even fast walking. But. <laughs> uh, so so Missy, speaking of that, um, just briefly, uh, how's the weather? How are things in, in in SoCal? And is it everything that we always think it is? Uh, lately, it's actually been pretty warm. This last week, we got into the 90 a few days. Uh, now it's a little calm down. It's like the high 70s, low 80s kind of perfect weather <laughs> that everybody thinks about. Um, but yeah, does this jersey look familiar? Yes, it does. <laughs> yes, that, that's that's one of the ones, one of my favorites. Uh, I'm glad you wore that today. Uh, appreciate you joining us, of course, as well, and sharing some time and spending some time with us. Uh, today on the podcast, I uh, want to start certainly on a bit of a somber note, of course, as uh, it's been a couple weeks at this point now that the official cancellation of the PWBA tour and certainly affects uh, many, including yourself. So we'll ask you to start by sharing just some of your initial thoughts and reactions to uh, the unfortunate news that you did have to hear and, and then kind of take in, if you will. So, of course, I completely understand 
uh, where USDC is coming from uh, with having to cancel our season. Uh, safety is the utmost importance. Um, but of course, I'm extremely uh, sad. I mean, I've been working really hard since last season uh, to try to get ready and to be prepared for this season. And I think by far, this is the hardest I've ever worked on my game prior to a season. So to then have that season canceled, it's definitely a disappointment. I, of course, yes. Uh, and, you know, Emil and I equally uh, disappointed at the fact that we won't be able to be out there on Bull TV and watching all you great athletes out there each and every week. But uh, as you mentioned, safety definitely is first. Uh, and, you know, safety has uh, been bringing folks together quite a bit as well over the course of the past few months. So, uh, of course, Drew, DJ, we want to know how the family's doing. How have you guys been uh, keeping busy the past couple of months? We've been doing a lot of fun family activities at home. So uh, from building forts when it was still in the cooler months to getting outside and playing a lot in our backyard, um, I've become an expert at lizard hunting. Wow. <laughs> we have a lot of, okay. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of lizards in our backyard, and so that's like our little daily thing. Also another expert at blowing very big bubbles. <laughs> so that's a couple of our daily activities. We usually play with bubbles, try to look for lizards, and uh, if it's really warm like it was last week, we get out like a, a kid's swimming pool, pretty big kid's swimming pool, and get a bunch of play stuff out and water tables and just have fun. Um, I know we, we briefly had a, a, a chat about it prior to uh, the show starting today, but I know Drew has been on a few shows just talking about uh, the business side of things. And I don't know if many people know that you guys are very involved from the pro shop perspective and own several pro shops uh, uh, around your area. So talk about the business side, how... Uh, you guys have been impacted and in, in kind of where you are in regards to reopening. So being from California, we were one of the very first states to uh, have a stay at home order. So we have been closed. All of our locations have been closed since March 17th. And just two weeks ago, we were able to open back up one of our locations. Uh, that's a, inside Arlington Lanes in Riverside, California. Uh, we have seven uh, park and and supply locations. So one of seven is currently open. And we are taking very strict measures. I know it's very different across the country, how people are kind of going about the safety protocols. But for us here, uh, especially in California, we're taking things very seriously. All of our employees are wearing masks. They also have face shields. They're also uh, all required to wear gloves. And we have very strict policy in place to protect uh, our employees and our customers. We want to just keep everybody very safe. Uh, we're also not letting really anyone inside of our pro shops. Um, we kind of have a table at the door. We don't want people touching all the merchandise. And so it's it's definitely a little unique. And um, Drew's done a great job at getting our employees ready. And he and I have really had a very busy schedule the last few weeks in preparation for all of it. And we're getting ready to open uh, two more locations. Uh, one in Rancho Cucamonga and one, I don't know if I'm allowed to say it, so <laughs> another one soon. <laughs> I don't know if that's actually been announced yet, so I won't say it. Um, but we're opening two more locations uh, within the next week, so we'll be very busy this week getting ready for that. I'm, I'm curious real quick, Aaron. I, I know you had one ready. Uh, just, just for my own knowledge, but how did you guys get into the pro shop uh, business? <laughs> Great question. So I actually grew up in a pro shop. So my father owned a pro shop since 1969. So I literally spent all the time inside the pro shop with him. He only had one location. Um, but yeah, growing up, I was always there. Summers, I actually went to the pro shop with him every single day. And so I've really been around the pro shop business my entire life. And right after Drew and I got married, um, my dad unfortunately got really sick right afterwards. And so he decided to, it was time for him to retire. And um, backstory a little bit, Drew was actually working for my father in the pro shop business. So he had been working for my dad for a few years already and knew the business very well and knew how to drill bowling balls very well. And my dad gave the business to us. So his business was called Precision Pro Shop. And we took over his location and we created Parkins Bowling Supply. 
And uh, that was in January 1st, 2011. And since then, um, we now have seven locations. And so Drew's uh, whole goal was always to expand and have multiple locations. And we've actually in total opened up 11 pro shops. Oh, so wow. we have, yeah, we had a few close um, due to like center closures and other issues. But yeah, we've actually opened 11 pro shops in that time frame. Incredibly experienced. That's uh, that's impressive. Nice, nicely done. Congrats, and especially on the one that uh, will be uh, uh, opening the the new one. We the won't secret. talk anymore about right. <laughs> uh, I kind of in just talking about prepping the shop to get ready for the open. Obviously, the pro shop business is a very hands on business. Um, so I mean. You know, obviously, you know, getting fit for a ball involves a lot of a lot of contact and all that. And I, I'm just curious, kind of like what the what the process was when trying to figure out what's how to make this as safe as possible. Uh, you know, just kind of how long of a process was that for for you and Drew to kind of figure out and to get to something where you were comfortable at? Uh, that took quite a while, actually. And I was kind of doing some research. There's a bowling pro shop Facebook group. Um, so I was doing some research and seeing what other people were doing. I would say by far we're taking the most precautions <laughs> from what I've been reading. Um, but we wanted to really make sure, like you said, our business is very hands-on. And in California right now, if you open, you have to have like a plexiglass kind of a thing. So our business, we can't have plexiglass because we have to fit people and we have to be able to measure them. And we uh, only use measuring balls. We don't use any other devices. So um, in order for all of that to happen, uh, we need our employees to be able to make that happen. So that's why we have the face shields that we're also requiring that all of our employees uh, wear gloves, especially when they're fitting the customers. I mean, but at all times they're wearing gloves. And then we have a very strict uh, procedure on what happens after somebody's measured and how to clean surfaces and how to clean you know, all of the inserts inside the measuring balls and the measuring ball and everything. And it, it took quite a while. It definitely took a lot of research. Um, I would say most of that back end stuff is what I do. I do most of the business side of the pro shop. Uh, so I take care of all that stuff and I put together all the procedures. Obviously, Drew and I were talking about it together. But yeah, it was a lot of work, a lot of work just to make sure that we're following all of our California guidelines um, in order to be able to open. Thank you for that. Yeah, that that was something that you know, when when folks think about you know businesses open up and all that, there there's so many small aspects about that, and I appreciate you kind of going into that for us and um, you know talked about you know kind of staying busy the past few months and uh, a shameless bold TV plug here. Uh, you were on the Gauntlet with host Curtis von Kruger, uh, I think two weeks ago now. Uh, you are the first PWBA player we've had the opportunity to talk to after they've been on the Gauntlet, so. Uh, you took on some, your good friend Scott Norton. I just want to hear a little bit more about that experience and kind of kind of what you thought about about the show and uh, ultimately were you upset that you didn't win? <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, the show is an absolute blast. Curtis does such a great job. Uh, the questions are hilarious and some of them are kind of crazy. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but yes, Scott, they and I, are. yes, Scott and I had <laughs> such a fun time and Scott and I are super competitive. So even when we, we like play, we'll have like game nights and stuff. And even when we're playing board games, like we're still very competitive. So uh, even prior to the whole thing, we're talking to Curtis before it started to air and we're like, oh no, you're going down, you know? <laughs> so yes, I was not happy that uh, I barely lost, but it's okay. He won fair and square. I only lost by one, so it was close. <laughs> But it, down to the wire. Um, for anybody that hasn't watched those, you need to go back and watch those because they're hilarious. They are. They are great. Emil, pop or soda? Oh, it's one hundred percent pop. And uh, <laughs> we we had a nice conversation about that during their during their episode. Uh, and I also learned that Scott opened up a, a, a new business too, right? Yes, he did. A nerdy by nature escape rooms. Um, coincidentally, uh, very soon he's opening his second room up, which is pirate themed, which is super cool. And I'm really excited this week. I'm actually going to be one of the testers. 
So I get to test it out. Uh, so there's going to be a group of us that are going to go test out his second room. So I'm super excited because I've seen a little bit. He doesn't obviously want to share too much. Sure. Escape room, but I've seen a little bit of what they've done, and it's incredible how the whole escape room looks. It's nuts. It's a ship. It's nuts. So I'm really excited. <laughs> I do look forward to uh, to, to visiting. Honestly, I've, I've been to a few escape rooms in my day, and uh, there's, there's I've never been to one that I haven't liked. So, uh, definitely looking forward to to that experience and and uh, really getting to that that part of the country um, as well. Aaron, have you have you done done any new escape rooms before we move on? I have not. So I oh. I still need that first one checked off the off the list. <laughs> so I, I I know a place now, so I just got to get out to California. There you go. <laughs> All right, so all right, we got to get Aaron on the escape room, but he's 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 eating and then doing stuff outside. So that's this is this is good. It's a good healthy balance uh, for Aaron Smith. Um, speaking of Bull TV, Missy, last week we had you, uh, or at least you were featured, uh, and you were gracious enough to join us in the chat in, in the Throwback Thursday match of the week. And the match was the from the 2011 USPC Queens title match between yourself and Alicia Current. Um, and before we get to the match portion. Uh, the, there was a driving force kind of behind your run at the 2011 USBC Queens. Can you talk a little bit about that? I know we've got a, a, a video to share uh, in that regard as well. Yes. So the previous year uh, at the 2010 USBC Queens, it was held in El Paso uh, at the Convention Center in Texas. And uh, during the Step Ladder Finals, I was bowling against Kelly Felix. Uh, I was ahead the entire map. Actually, rewatched that not that long ago. And um, at the end, she kind of struck out in the ninth and tenth, kind of like one of those, oh, I'll strike out, but I kind of have no chance. And you can kind of see it in her face that she's just like, oh, okay, well, at least now she has to mark. And I, I don't think I had really missed a pocket um, that whole game. So I just needed to go up and mark to advance. I could have struck out for like 240. And uh, I threw a great shot, which to this day, I would not change a thing. Uh, I would throw that shot exactly the same. And I left the pocket 710. And but, yeah, here we go. <laughs> now, if you were Kelly, would you watch Do you watch the other bowler of the situation? I was watching the 10th frame. Before that, it's kind of up to the individual, but you want to know now. Posts. You can see my dad in the background. <laughs> with his hand over his yeah. head. <laughs> mm -hmm. The only result that could stop her. From Even playing. Kelly can't believe it there. Yeah. No, I think I threw it really good. But the house is just stunned. Wow. And on. So you you just watched that obviously, and you you re can obviously recount it and know exactly what happened. Um, and then we watched the show uh, on Thursday. So what was it like, kind of reliving it again, the 2011 version, and then seeing your your triumphs? And uh, when was the last time you watched it? And, and thanks for you know, the interaction. The viewers loved it, by the way. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. So I haven't I hadn't watched it in full in a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually is one of my like mental preparations for the season. I put together a highlight video of my helps that I watch on a very consistent basis weekly. Um, and part of the 2011 Queens is in that. So yes, I do see that on a consistent basis towards the end, but I haven't watched the show in full in quite a while. So there were some things in there that I totally didn't remember. Like I totally forgot about the fire thing that happened the night before <laughs> that was crazy by the way absolutely crazy um but yeah it was really fun to rewatch that show and relive it and i will tell you that that was by far the most determined uh i had ever been in my career to win a tournament there was zero doubt in my mind that i was not going to make that tv show the next year and i mean as you guys know the queens is a different animal sure. making mm -hmm. that show. I mean, you have to hit the right people at the right times. You have to get the right breaks. I mean, it's all head-to-head -head matches and crazy. But I was so determined, and it was like this fire inside me. And I remember telling myself once the TV show hit, like, I'm going to just strike. I'm going to make the pins fall. 
which you know we can't do but that's the attitude i had that i was going to will the pins down they were going to fall and so it was it was definitely uh very crazy and fun to watch <laughs> Now, taking a look back at that match, uh, you know, Alicia stepping up in the ninth and 10th, uh, you know, working on a strike, had the opportunity to go around you. Uh, she washed out uh, and then essentially with, with being unable to double in the 10th, uh, you know, you got up there with the opportunity just to kind of step up in the 10th and enjoy the moment, almost almost kind of a victory lap, if you will, just uh, had to get a good count on that first shot. So what was it like just knowing, you know, a year later after, you know, what could have been your first queen's title you know who would have known what happened the rest of the way out but to just have that moment to enjoy that moment and to uh to get that win i think in the moment there's so many emotions going through your head that you're almost kind of numb you know uh i definitely i will say did not expect to be able to go up in the 10th frame when i was sitting on the bench uh going i did not expect to be able to go up in the 10th frame and not need something uh, Alicia's a great player. She's been going phenomenal all week. So that was a, a surprise to me. But yeah, being able to go up in the 10th and not really need a whole lot was crazy. And I mean, after I got the first strike in the 10th and and just knowing that I won the title and actually came back after what had happened the previous year, it was just the best feeling ever. Really well. And we got a clip that will uh, kind of show that final shot that officially wrapped it up. But they also uh, dropped a little interview with you uh, talking about some changes you had made in your game from 2010 to 2011. So let's take a quick look at that one more time here. So the folks at Bull TV will uh, will certainly know this one already. But what did you learn last year? Go close to winning this championship. Quite good. I definitely learned that I needed to tweak some things in my game. Uh, I've I've definitely in the past had some issues with carry and so um, I went back home and I tweaked my grip a little bit so I changed my grip which I think uh, has changed my release and I also worked on my release and I think the combination of the two has definitely helped my carry. There's the smile we've been waiting for. She's waited a year for this moment, a year of, I'm sure there were times that that 7-10 split against Kelly Kulik haunted her. She's thought about it a lot, and she has now erased that memory, and instead she'll replace it with a tiara. Fantastic performance from Excellent start Excellent run there by Dave Lamont. Yeah, that was All well said. <laughs> Fantastic, throwing big shots when she needed to, and did it again here. That was pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> that was really cool. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. And even to make that TV show, like, I went against some really heavy hitters to even make that TV show. Uh, I, I bowled against Liz Johnson and knocked her into the loser, loser's bracket. I bowled against CDB, knocked her into the loser's bracket. So I did not have like an easy path to make that show. <laughs> so I think that this made it a little more sweet also. And like uh, Dave said about the 710, that entire next year, anytime, anytime I left a pocket 710, it was a big chip on my shoulder. Like it was pretty much. I won't say pretty much. It definitely was. If I left a pocket 710, I switched balls. Like, even if I didn't need to, like, it was bad. I kind of had a complex for a while. Like, it was kind of bad. I've calmed down things. I don't switch balls necessarily if I leave a pocket 710. <laughs> but, I, yeah, I definitely had an issue with leaving them. Well, Guy, Guy Pryor uh, watching on Facebook asked, I think he asked earlier, have you made, oh, I'm sorry, that might have been Ray. It was Ray watching, uh, or excuse me, Roy on YouTube watching, have you ever picked up the 710? So not necessarily at that time, obviously, but in general in your career, have you made it at some point? Yes, I made oh. it a few times. And actually, I did make it once um, on uh, back extra frame, but I made it on a live stream uh, during a PBA event at the stadium, at the National Stadium. Like, How about like, that? which those pins don't bounce. <laughs> that's, that's very true. That's true. That's 100% true. That's pretty cool. <laughs> there, there were a couple other things before we shift gears um, and I watched that show or that match specifically a lot last week, just getting it prepared for uh, bowl TV purposes. Uh, there were a couple things that stood out and you mentioned it. Some of the players that you had a chance to uh, uh, compete against during your queen's run. And even on TV, uh, in the semis, you had to bowl against Kim, uh, yeah. Kim Terrell Kearney. I'm exactly. just curious what it's like to bowl against someone 
uh, of that statue. And I'm sure someone, obviously, that you've looked up to uh, in that regard as well. And obviously, she is revered, certainly a Hall of Famer. So what what is that like to to have to beat someone like that just to get to the title match in a, in a situation where you're obviously utmost determined to, uh, to win this event? So first of all, I think I'm a little crazy because I like those matches more. I would rather have to bowl, you know, the top bowlers. And at the time, I mean, all of them that I just said are Hall of Famers, all of them. Mm-hmm. And I love him to death. I love all of them. And I've been fortunate that I've been bowling against them since, I was pretty young, uh, only in the Queens and the U.S. Open because there was no tour when I finished college. But even when I was in college, uh, I started bowling the Queens and the U.S. Open right when I was, uh, I think I just turned 19. So I I started competing against uh, all these ladies at that time when I was still really young in college. And um, I have the utmost respect for all of them. And growing up with my father being a professional bowler, and definitely making sure that I know the history of bowling. <laughs> I knew all these women and even the generation prior to that. Uh, one of my other moms is Virginia Norton. She's a Hall of Famer. I know all of those ladies in her class and I have the utmost respect for all of them. But when we get on the lanes, we're not really competing necessarily against them mm-hmm. or whoever it is. We're really competing against ourselves. Now in the Queens, there's some little difference because we can manipulate lanes a little bit and do a few things to try to make the lanes, you know, play for our favor, etc. But in general, it's really just me throwing the ball down the lane and whatever the other person does, I have no control over. So all I can control is what I do. And that's really how I look at all these matches. But my entire career, I have loved head to head competition. Um, I love round round match play. I love like the Queens event because of that, because it's head to head. And I am kind of crazy in the sense that I would rather have to go up on the 10th and throw a shot than just be able to go up and not need anything. I'm kind of crazy that way. I like to be able to go up on the 10th and throw a good shot and strike. Um, but that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> I like the confidence there. That's uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was, you know, as a, not very good overall player. That was always a thing that would always creep into my mind is that, oh, oh my God, I need this. I need to find a way to mark. I need to find a way to do something. And then all of a sudden, obviously, that affects the shot and the quality and all that good stuff. But uh, no, I appreciate the tenacity that uh, that you had there. Yeah. And I mean, quite often when we get asked, like, what's one of the strengths of your game? That is one thing I will always say is that I know I can throw the shot under pressure. And I can't always say that I'm going to strike. And here lately, that hasn't been the case. I haven't struck, but I know it's going to be there. And I know I'm going to throw it good. And that's all we can really do from our end. Aaron and I were chatting briefly uh, prior to the show, and we were talking about 2011, you know, 2010, and just that time period, uh, of course, with with no women's tour, but obviously U.S. Women's Open and the Queens. And I know when I was watching last week, I think it really hit me that, you were often on a lot of those shows, 2010, 2011. You were in Reno against Kelly again in 2012. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure if maybe people realized it, but, I mean, you were just as good. Um, and obviously Kelly certainly gets her due because of what she was doing in that time. But, I mean, you should get the same uh, same due in that sense. So what was that time period like for you as a, as a player now, obviously, you, knowing how many events you have and you got to make the most each time out, but clearly you were uh, on, on a very high level uh, at, on your game as well. Yes. Yeah, so during that time frame, we obviously did not have a women's tour, mm-hmm. and I was bowling anything and everything I possibly could um, because bowling is all I did. I didn't have another job. So I completed uh, on the men's tour, competed in PBA events, um for a short period the men's tour was still exempt so i actually went overseas and bowled a lot i bowled uh, i almost moved to europe not a lot of people know that and i haven't actually said that a lot i actually moved almost just to spain barcelona uh to just compete full time on the european bowling tour um and i competed over in asia as well in japan a lot during that time frame 
And yes, at the time frame when I was making a ton of TV shows and in my career where I made a majority of my TV shows, we didn't have TV shows. <laughs> we, we had two a year, like you said. Mm -hmm. And if there was some event that they created, like um, a world bowling tour, oh, we have a TV show. Well, then I decided, well, I'm going to make that show. So I'm going to bowl anything and everything I need to to get the points to make that show. And then the PBA created this regional challenge thing. Well, I'm going to do whatever I can to make that show. And um, I also got invited to some special events with the PBA during that time frame. I got to bowl with Blake Griffin. That was very cool. <laughs> I was the first woman to be, first woman professional to be on one of those shows. And um, I also got to compete like in the uh, summer series with, with uh, I was one, one of the only women to compete in that when all the manufacturers had their own teams and kind of bowled against each other. And, oh, and yeah. so that was fun. We actually won. We were the underdogs. I won't name the team, but yeah, because I'm not with that company anymore. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, uh, it was a lot of fun. And yes, there was nothing to bowl during that time. So I knew going into a Queens event or the U.S. Open, when we only have two a year. I mean, that's it. So I really, um, you know, put a lot of practice in and really got myself mentally tough. And I kind of just had this confidence that, well, I'm just gonna make the TV show. And, <laughs> and that's just kind of how I went about it uh, because that's all we have. But yeah, it was definitely different times for sure. What ended up stopping you from making the move to Spain? Uh, the PBA uh, was not exempt anymore. So I was able to, to bowl PBA tour events. And that was the one reason sure. I did not. Yep. The, if, if the PBA tour had been exempt for a few more years, I probably would have moved. <laughs> Could have been a lot of life altering things that, uh, that had right. that move happen right there. <laughs> yes. How about that? Well, uh, oh, man, excellent stuff right there. Uh, Missy, mm -hmm. appreciate you sharing that. Uh, and this is what the PWB podcast is about folks uh, getting into uh, obviously the lives and hopefully they share some, some info that we may not know uh, on this podcast. And uh, I want to thank everyone watching on Bull TV, uh, the PWA Facebook page and the Bull TV YouTube page as well. Uh, if you have any questions for Missy, please drop those in the respective chats and we will try to get to those uh, as we continue on. Uh, Aaron, what you got? Uh, I, I think we can kind of jump off this. Um, when we were watching the Throwback Thursday match of the week, uh, towards the end, Emil, uh, in the chat... Uh, which is a great place to be, by the way, for these events. So, Bull TV chat. Um, uh, Emil asked you, uh, you know, was there, had there been an event that kind of caused the same type of drive that we just talked about? That's the 710 in El Paso. And you very frankly said, yes, Sonoma County, Sonoma County in 2019, an event which you, uh, which you led wire to wire uh, and bowled a great game in the title match. Uh, just ran to Shana Ung, who had the front seven, shot 250. Just wasn't quite enough to get the win. But, um, you, know, you know, Emil, I'll, I'll throw it back to you to, uh, to that question. Obviously, you were there that week. You got to see it all kind of unfold. Uh, what were your impressions? And then, Missy, just uh, talk about that drive of getting back onto the lanes to uh, have that event push you even more. Well, I'll say for me personally, uh, obviously, watching the, the full event unfold from, from start to finish, I mean, uh, up until that point, I mean, I had seen Missy a lot, and I had seen her in some in some opportunities to to make some TV shows uh, as well and slightly come up short. But that just didn't look to be the case that week. Like from start to finish, she looked to be uh, in control, um, aggressive. I, I won't say fierce because she's always got this great smile, but it, it, in that same mode, it was it was it was definitely a, you know I'm here to win uh, this week, and that's obviously the same every week, but. I just thought it was a bit more visual uh, in that regard. And then, you know, not not being a professional athlete bowling at the highest levels, I know stepladder finals and one-game matches can, can go either way. I mean, you can do everything you can do leading up to or during the week and then get to a stepladder and, and have it go the other way. So, obviously, that was disappointing uh, for you, Missy. And, um, and as Aaron mentioned, what, what was that part like? How did you uh, – how did you handle the situation? And then what were you working on? Uh, you know, definitely from that standpoint of, hey, here's what happened to me in Sonoma County. This is what's going to drive me uh, to my next title. So so first going into that event, uh, we had already finished one swing of the tour. 
and going into the the next wing it was all on the west coast mm -hmm. and i knew that i bowled very well at double decker lanes in roner park which is sonoma and i knew i bowled very well in fountain valley mm -hmm. and i worked very hard on my game so it was right after the queens we usually have like a little week week and a half ish off and i practiced a lot and i wanted to be very sharp for that swing and i made two of those tv shows mm -hmm. <laughs> And one of them was Sonoma, and that was the very first event um, after the Queens, so going into the first uh, West Coast swing. And uh, I bowled in that bowling center quite a bit in PBA regional events prior to the PWBA having national course stops there. And so it is a very difficult center. Lane to lane, pair to pair is crazy in there, and I keep very good notes, very, very detailed notes. And so I have notes uh, from years back bowling in that bowling center. So I know certain lanes, what the characteristics are. And a lot of people are like, how did you not even have a low game? Like, how did you not even do under 200 in that place? Like people are struggling to literally like average 200. Yeah. I really didn't have any games under that. And that was because I have very detailed notes <laughs> uh, on how to attack that bowling center. And luckily I was, throwing the ball very well too, so that I can make moves immediately in the beginning of games in order to keep up with the moves. Cause like I said, a lot of the pairs in there are different from lane to lane. Then you move pairs and they're completely different again. Um, but anyway, going back to the event, uh, I bowled really well. I led by a lot over 300 something pins. And you'll probably knows. I don't Two, know. 288. Okay. 288. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The, the tournament had ended at the round of 12. You'd have won by 288 pins. Okay. So, um, so I knew I, I, you know, I'd led the tournament the whole time and by a lot of pins. And in the step ladder finals, I really loved every single shot that I threw. Uh, I, I rewatched it afterwards. And I knew I executed to the best of my ability on every single shot. And for me to shoot 230, what did I shoot? 230, what? I'm sure you know, you know 237. Okay, 237. Couldn't remember if it was eight, seven or eight. Um, but for me to shoot 237 and lose, I mean, that doesn't happen that often uh, in step ladder finals. And I did that twice last year. I shot 230 something and lost um, in the step ladders. And that is a big driving force for me. So, Last year um, was the first year, year I felt like I could actually bowl like myself again uh, for several reasons. And I felt like last year was my real first year bowling like me again. And I did a lot of uh, things that I wanted to accomplish. Um, I, I have goals, you know, that I, that I look uh, at, not just, you know, tournament wins or something like that, but other goals like my spare percentages and, how I pick up single pin spares, how many I missed. I keep track of all of that. And I made all those uh, goals. I cash in every event. I made match play in every single major and I made three step ladder finals. For most people, they would say, yeah, that's a great season. I was mad. After the tour championship, and you can ask all my family and friends, I don't really cry, I'm not a crier. After the tour championship, I walked off that set and in the back and I lost it, completely lost it, I was balling. And my reps came up to me, some of the girls came up to me because they know like I don't cry. And I was just extremely disappointed. Yes, I had done a lot of things that I wanted to, but I didn't win. And that really has driven me. And even right then, pretty much like a few hours after I lost at the tour championship, I put into effect some things that now I'm still doing uh, in order to prepare for this season and now what I'm doing to prepare for next season. And that's really a driving force. And like I said, um, with the 2010 Queens going to the 2011 Queens, well, that whole last season, which started with Sonoma, that's what has been driving me uh, to really bowl like me and bowl to my potential. I think that's very interesting because our next question kind of leads into that. So I'm hoping you'll dive into it a little bit more. But, uh, you know, I, we're, we're five seasons in on the relaunch of the tour. And obviously uh, there, there's been some highs. There's been some lows along the way. But, uh, you know, talking about how it really felt like your first true season, uh, you know, just to kind of look back at some of those moments and how you ended up uh, 
getting there. And now, obviously, we know what you're looking forward to moving on. But just kind of how did you get there? What were some of the high points? And uh, what were some of the tougher moments, too, that, uh, you, you know, kind of led you to these uh, realizations or moments? So when the PWBA tour uh, relaunched back in 2015, I was definitely at the top of my game. I was still making all the TV shows and, you know, on TV a lot. And so I had very big um, hopes and goals and dreams for myself when the tour came back. And uh, unfortunately, and I don't make excuses, but unfortunately a lot of things go on in my personal life that affected my bowling. And I've been pretty open with that. So uh, my husband and I, we've been trying to have a baby and I had two miscarriages. Uh, one was just before the 2015 tour started. And the next one was during the 2016 tour at a tour event. And then uh, fortunately in 2017, uh, I was pregnant the whole season. And uh, then I had my son, CJ. And in 2018, I had just had him. Like, uh, I had a C-section. I wasn't allowed to bowl, you know, for even longer than most people after they have a baby. And so I'd only been practicing for like a month and a half before the season started. And I bowled every single event. And I would say I bowled well, but was I 100%? No. <laughs> um, I wasn't back in 100% shape. I couldn't get back in shape that quick after having a baby. So 2019 for me um, was really the first true season that I could actually feel like I could compete like myself again, um, that everything was just in place. We had other things go on during this, those seasons. We lost a main pro shop during some of those early seasons. Uh, we had our house flood while I was on tour. We had to be out of our house for an entire six months. That was another thing that happened. There was a lot of just bad things personally that mm -hmm. happened. And as much as we like to, you know, leave all of our outside stuff um, out of the building in the bowling center once we step on the lane, sometimes it's just hard to do that. And so unfortunately, I didn't compete uh, to my abilities. And so I feel like last year was the first year I really could compete like myself. And I feel like this year, uh, if we had a tour and we were bowling, uh, it would be even better because of all the preparations that I have been doing. And then I will continue to do going into next year. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing on that, Missy. Mm -hmm. Wow. Camille? Yeah, that's uh, that's heavy. That's heavy uh, for for me. I think on on a couple of different levels. One, uh, having gone through the miscarriage part as well. My wife and I had that happen to us. Our, our first attempt. Um, so having no knowledge of it before you going through it, and then. You know, we've talked about this before, but it still doesn't really it didn't really hit me. And I understood it and I wanted to, you know, certainly uh, make sure I could do and say whatever I could. But then when you actually experience it, it's just a completely different thing. Um, I appreciate you sharing that. And then two, just from a uh, the, the, the female athlete perspective and what you guys go through uh, often and to be able to consistently perform at the highest levels and, uh, you know, just rock stars certainly uh in our book 100 percent um that was that was heavy we appreciate you sharing that yeah. um transition we got some questions too by the way so okay. uh, don't forget those we got that coming up i see your questions folks so we'll get to them 2019 uh world women's championships you won gold in trios with jordan richard and uh, liz colkin um, talk about that experience and uh, some of those some of the highlights that you recall, um, you know, with the victory as someone who, you know, would like to win a gold medal at some point in life. And no matter when it is, <laughs> uh, what is that feeling like? And in, in, uh, when when you come through for not only your team, yourself and certainly your, your country. So the Women's World Championships is the biggest stage that you can compete on as, uh, as a part of Team USA. And so even being able to be selected for that, which is only six women in the entire country, uh, is a huge deal. Being a part of the team is a huge deal, let alone being selected as one of those six people. And so I was very honored last year that I got um, a chance to go back to the Women's World Championships. I had competed previously one time and uh, we had lost. Um, I had got a couple silver medals in doubles and in teams. 
And so I wanted definitely going back there to try to win gold, definitely in team events, um, but in any event, really. I mean, that's a huge, huge stage, like I said, and a lot of people might not understand how big of a deal that is, but that is the closest thing we have to the Olympics. Um, so uh, for our trios event, uh, I would say we were the underdogs. So even though, you know, Liz and, and Jordan are amazing, amazing athletes, but they are both, they were rookies, you know, for a Team USA aspect. Sure. They, they both had never been to the uh, adult uh, world championships. And so they were both nervous and we all could see that, which is expected. Uh, even though, you know, they've won major titles and, you know, Liz winning the US Open and they've won, you know, on the PWBA tour, but they were definitely nervous. So I would say we were definitely the underdog team. Uh, so the other team consisted of Shannon O'Keefe, Stephanie Nation, and Danielle McCune. All been on Team USA a lot of years, all been at the World Championships multiple times. Um, so it was me and the two little newbies. And, <laughs> <laughs> and we had a blast. I will say we communicated very well with each other throughout all qualifying. Uh, it was very close for us to make the stepladder finals, and we had some crazy, crazy, uh, really uh, big shots in the 10th frame by all of us uh, to get into the stepladder finals. And then when we were on the TV show, and I watched that show not that long ago, so we were losing, and we were down pretty good um, at the time uh, during the gold medal match. And I could just tell that the energy was kind of taken out of both the girls. And so I remember like Liz came off the approach. This was like the sixth frame, I think. Liz came off the approach and she was gonna go back and talk to Mark, uh, our coach. And I like grabbed her <laughs> and, and grabbed Jordan. I was like, look, we still have a lot of frames left. I said, put your head up, which, we had a, a little mental session uh, with one of our mental performance coaches that I now work with, uh, Brian King. He came to us and talked to us about a few things that we were going to work on for the week. So anyway, I reminded them of that. And I said, look, stand tall, head up. We have a lot of frames left. Let's do this. And from that point on, you could see that there was a switch that flipped. And then we started all striking. <laughs> and that was, a, that was fun. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. So, uh, and then, you know, to just end out the whole match uh, as we did and, and win the medal. I mean, you can see all the emotions and all those pictures. And if you watch that uh, live stream again, the video, it, it, it was a really cool moment. And so to, <laughs> yes, I said the medal. So for us to come back from behind like we did and win, that was just incredible. And yeah, that, that's my first goal at Women's World. Now, obviously, a lot of emotions, and, and I, I, I rewatched that as well yesterday for uh, leading into this, just as some preparation. And, and I, I was actually going to bring up that point because, I mean, you, you aren't kidding about, you know, you, you grabbed Liz, you stopped <laughs> her right there, you got there, and you were the leadoff player too, so you were the one stepping up first next. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's one of those things where we've seen you compete as an individual for so long that, you know, seeing you in that, in that team atmosphere it, is a little different. That was like a different type of Missy on that show almost. Yeah. And, and I caught that. I wanted to ask about that and kind of what was going on in that conversation, but you kind of ran it down right there. But, uh, you know, and then that seventh and eighth frame, both uh, or all three of you, I believe, uh, struck out those frames to kind of take the momentum back from a very talented Columbia team. Uh, but, you know, your first medal at the World Championships, that had to be amazing. But the real question is, how on earth do they actually taste? <laughs> I've always wondered that. I've never had the opportunity. <laughs> we'll talk about that. But, <laughs> but yeah, you did bring up a good point, Aaron. And I think that shocked a lot of, so like I said, Liz and Jordan, they've never bowled with me in the, in that big of an event. We had bowled the previous year at PAPCON together in the Dominican Republic, but definitely I get more fired up for the world. And everybody's used to seeing me bowl like I normally bowl in individual events 
and I do my show and I come back and I'm just like, okay, I'm happy, whatever. But um, fist pump, maybe, you know. Yeah, yeah. Maybe fist pump, <laughs> but that at the world, yeah, it's a whole different ball game. I mean, I'm coming back like that picture that you guys put up there. I mean, that's how I would come back off the approach and I would scream and yell every single shot. And it's a lot more intense. <laughs> and yeah, so I think the first time when we started competing, they were just like, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was, that was a ton of fun. So much fun. Folks, be sure to check that out on YouTube. That's a uh, World Bowling uh, page to find that at Trio's Finals for 2019 World Women's Championships. Definitely a, a great show. And you talked about the emotions, too. You get to see all that. So I would recommend folks do check that out. Eric, um, can you toss the photo up real quick one more time? For you, Emil, since we only have and, and really five more days in our mid-30s together. <laughs> uh, sure. Should be that one. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's it. Yeah, and that's one of my favorite pictures right now, by far. <laughs> but yeah, pretty, that, that cool. much emotion right there uh, after every set. <laughs> uh, I'll ask this just as one final on this particular subject, but did this, did this TV show feel any different than any other uh, TV show you've been on at that point? And obviously you've been on very many. So from that aspect, there's some experience uh, but but with the, what was on the line in a, in a different situation, you know, not a professional event per se, uh, but, but more about team aspects, country aspects. Was it different in that light? 100 percent. I think any time that we are um, honored enough to wear the red, white and blue and have USA on our back, that adds a whole new level and dimension um, of how much that event really means to us. Uh, sometimes we get caught up in that, unfortunately. Uh, but yes, that's that's a whole different ball game to just know that what you're doing it not only affects you. Now you have teammates, but also you're representing the entire country, and that means a lot. Uh, also at that event, because it was in Vegas, it was really cool. My entire family was able to come, so my parents were there, Drew was there, my in-laws were there, my sister and brother-in-law were there, UJ was there. I mean, I had a ton of people. Plus. Um, I think Jordan's mom and sister came in mm -hmm. and I mean, it was, we just all had our families back there too. And it just meant so much to be able to bring home that gold for the U S uh, incredible. Absolutely incredible. Excellent. And uh, to, to switch gears slightly, I know Aaron and well, both of us have uh, been, been checking out and what's going on with your most recent one take series. Uh, and Aaron pointed out something very specific in, in one of the recent episodes. So, so Aaron, talk a little bit about that uh, the specific episode you mentioned, and uh, let's let's get into that. I uh, I've enjoyed them all. I I, I really liked um, telling the tale of how you and Drew kind of kind of met and all that stuff. So I know Emil likes asking that question. So Emil, you gotta check that one out. <laughs> but uh, but I I, I love the first uh, three hundred story about how you how you borrowed your mom's bowling ball because it was a pound more and your, your, your hand fit kind of this, you know, perfectly for that. And then bowling three different in three different centers for the traveling league. Uh, I, I just thought that was super awesome. And you still have the ball. It looks brand new. Yeah, <laughs> I do still have the ball and my mom never got it back. <laughs> That's cold, Missy. That's cold. But, <laughs> I, I'm sure she was okay with uh, with giving that one up, though. Yes. But uh, after shot, yeah, after I shot the first 300, she kind of knew. Okay, I'm not getting that ball back. <laughs> but uh, I've really enjoyed those. So I, I'm kind of curious, what was your inspiration for those, uh, and kind of kind of bring that out? Obviously, we all kind of have a little bit more time on our hands and trying to find ways to interact. But uh, kind of, what was your motivation to start putting this together on a weekly basis? So great question. Uh, so one of the previous, so first of all, I had this crazy idea. I was like, you know, I want to put together something on IGTV. It's a new platform that a lot of people are using. Um, but I don't have a whole lot of time. I mean, I'm, I'm still very, very busy, uh, with training, with getting the pro swaps ready, DJ, I mean, everything. So I'm like, well, I want to do something where it's not a lot of editing. And I kind of thought back to a funny little game that I used to play with one of the previous uh, USBC videographers. So mm -hmm. Matt Lawson, Matt mm -hmm. Lawson and I had a little thing that whenever he asked me, you know, to, Hey, Missy, I need you to do like this little blurb for this upcoming commercial or this little blurb for, 
you know, to promote X, Y, Z. You say, okay, this is kind of what I want you to say or say something like this. And I said, I would always say, okay, but we're going to do it in one take. I'm going to do it one time. That's it. I'm be done. And pretty much every time I did do it just one time. And he would be like, yes, perfect. Great. So I was like, well, what if I just do one take? And if I screw up, whatever, I'm just going to keep going, keep talking and I don't have to edit it and uh, it'll be really easy. And then I'll, I'll try to boost my Instagram account and do this new TV uh, series on IGTV. So that was kind of the inspiration behind it. And I wanted to kind of keep it light and fun and tell little stories that probably people have never heard before. Uh, trying to stay away from the typical questions we always get asked and kind of just, you know, give viewers something new and different. And so far, I think people are liking it. So uh, if you haven't checked it out, make sure to uh, be sure to check it out on uh, my IGTV and my Instagram. Uh, it's called One Take by Missy Parkin. And yes, I feature a new video every Wednesday. So, so by chance, can we have a little sneak peek or at least the subject matter <laughs> for, uh, for the one coming up? Yes. So this week coming up is actually a very crazy story. I apologize to my parents and to uh -oh. Scott Martin's parents because they might not know this story. Uh, but it is actually a crazy story about a very near-death experience. Oh, wow. Yes. Uh, okay. So you have to check that out. It, yes. uh, it's also shot on location, so it's not in this room where I do several of them actually on location uh so yeah be sure to check that out it's a crazy crazy story and i i guarantee you will like it <laughs> that, that is a hard there tease are. right there that so. is. <laughs> <laughs> nicely done okay wednesdays don't forget folks uh on IGTV. uh we are about at the end uh at this point almost missy so we got some fan questions we've got kind of two more things that uh, we had in mind uh, so to speak as well. Uh, actually, I think we just kind of covered it. Uh, no, we did. Uh, there's a little follow up to that. For okay. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll actually, I'll, I'll say, Aaron, go ahead and, and uh, continue with that follow up. It is a very good one. Well, I, I enjoyed seeing the, I believe, was it a piranha sea? Yes. Piranha okay. sea. Yeah. Dave, yes. Uh, I think that's a very fun ball for Matt Canizaro as well. I'll have to double check with him, but I think he might've had his first 300 or 800 or both with it. Uh, so shout out to, to the piranha, but um, you know, I, I always love seeing like old bowling balls like that and folks keep that around. And uh, you know, you don't see them too much in the arsenals nowadays, but you know, over the past, you know, year of being on tour, I see you always have an older ball, a discontinued ball that's kind of travels with you everywhere. It's a Columbia 300 oath. And yeah. You know, you, you don't see those out there any, very often anymore. So I'm I'm sure it's just a, a ball you love. But I'm curious how that always finds its way into the bag for you each and every week on the PWBA tour. So that ball for me is definitely one of those like safety balls. Uh, it, it's really it blends out the pattern. So if all my other stuff is kind of overreacting, uh, or if I don't really know what the heck I should be doing, sometimes that ball just gets got. Uh, I just grab that ball out of the bag. And, and try it, especially if it's a longer pattern. And um, I did win uh, a 2014 uh, Women's Regional Finals with that ball. And even at that time, in 2014, I remember that that ball was older because there was kind of question on, well, is it okay if I use this ball? Like, yeah, I've used it, it looks great on TV. And it was old then, so <laughs> I do know that. And um, so yeah, it is still in my bag and actually in, not this past year, but I think the year before, uh, sorry, 2018 at uh, Fountain Valley, that is the ball I used the entire time to make the step ladder finals. And it was an O and it was a new one. And I still have to, if in case you're wondering, I still have, uh, <laughs> I still have two new ones, undrilled. Um, but the one that I currently have is, is fairly new and I don't use it very often. It is in my bag, but it only comes out for special occasions. <laughs> All right, there we go. That, that answers that question. Perfect. How about that? All right, so we are exactly one hour in, so our time is coming to an end. We've got one more question, but first, as we mentioned, we've got uh, a couple fan questions. Um, I'm just going to start popping in a few things on the screen for you, Missy. This one is not a question, but more of a uh, of a good statement talking about kind of your knowledge and why 
that person or guy believes you are one of the best, certainly. Um, I would agree. Your, your knowledge of the game it was definitely on point, and certainly the history just in this conversation alone. So uh, we definitely appreciate that. Um, here's someone you know. I know you know well. Uh, there's Troy. <laughs> Have you ever tried to throw a backup ball? I feel like there's some underlying meaning behind that question. <laughs> I don't know what the underlying meaning is. So, <laughs> have I tried it? Yes. Was it successful? Not really. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I definitely don't have it perfected. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question because uh, people often ask, and specifically about you and, and uh, what pound or what bowling ball weight uh, that you throw. So I would ask as a coaching uh, individual, and we'll talk about that next, just – what do you recommend for for ball weight? And, and you might not even have to generalize it, you know, from a gender perspective. But uh, what do you first of all? What what pound do you throw? What do you recommend? And, and kind of how do you help people uh, in that regard from a coaching perspective? So first of all, I throw sixteen pounds. Mm -hmm. um, some people might not know that. Uh, I'm one of the few women that that do, and I have been doing that since I was fifteen years old, and I was very tiny at fifteen. <laughs> Um, so to preface that, I feel like uh, bowlers should have a weight that is uh, as heavy as they can handle. I feel oftentimes bowlers go too light, uh, thinking, oh, well, I won't hurt myself. Well, actually, you can hurt yourself more. Because if it's too light, then you can overuse your muscles and muscle the ball, which not only makes you not bowl very well, but also it, it could cause an injury. And so it's very important, number one, to get the ball to fit you correctly. So the fitting and uh, of the bowling ball is very important, meaning that your thumb hole needs to be snug. Uh, it can't be super large and big so that you're having to like really grab on and use all your muscles to hold on to the ball. That's not how you should be bowling. Uh, you want to have a more relaxed free swing. And so if for people that don't have any injuries, um, usually for guys, that means 15s or 16s, women 14 or 15, they're, I mean, the technology has advanced so much that yes, there's not as much difference as there used to be in pounds, but there still is some. Uh, so example for women, especially I see all too often in the pro shop uh, industry, uh, actually I won't just say women, men as well, because I've had some pretty big guys come in and want 12 pound bowling balls and I'm like, whoa, hold on. And as soon as, and if I'm in the pro shop, as soon as I tell them well, I throw a 16, well, then they're like, whoa, okay, well. But it's important just to have a ball that's uh, as heavy as you can handle. And um, for those bowlers out there that might be wondering this question, if you're actually holding the ball in both hands, it should feel a little heavy. If it feels just right, and I ask customers this, if they pick up a ball and they're like, oh, it feels just right. I'm like, oh, well then it's too light. It needs to be a little heavier uh, because it should feel a little heavy and when you're holding it in both hands. And that's if you're putting your thumb in. Good answer to that. Mm -hmm. um, this one is from Jonathan, but you answered it, but I just wanted to, to let him know that we, we did see it. But when you bowl that great, does it make you want to practice more? You were talking about Sonoma and then you certainly answered that question and you went right to it uh, after that point. So absolutely. Um, let's see, Missy, are you bowling the uh, Open Championships or, or uh, in Reno later this year? That's a question for you. Um, I currently do not have a scheduled team uh, to bowl that event. My team, um, prior to all this stuff happening, mm -hmm. and I normally bowl with, uh, kind of wanted to take the year off. Uh, that doesn't mean I might not go up there and pub or something. I've been known to put my name on there, so... Uh, we'll see. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. This one is from Chris Pulliam. And uh, Chris said both his mom and himself have benefited from personal lessons from you as well as Drew. So how did you get into coaching and how has that impacted your professional career? So I started coaching when I was 16 years old. I started coaching juniors. Uh, and I really got uh, very heavily involved in coaching, I would say, after college, when I finished college. Uh, and I started to work for my dad. And so that was in my very early 20s. And I started creating a, a very big uh, customer base 
and uh, started giving a lot of individual one-on-one -on -one lessons. Um, now I've done clinics all over the world uh, for all companies. Uh, and I think that definitely helps my game a ton because sometimes I'll be giving a lesson, even now, um, I'll be giving a lesson and I'm like, you know, I wonder if I'm doing that. <laughs> it's always good to kind of check in with your own fundamentals. Uh, or it could just bring up something that, hey, maybe I need to check that out and make sure, you know, that I'm doing X, Y, Z or look how that looks on my game or whatever. But it's, it's always a good idea. Um, but I think, yes, uh, I love doing it, number one. Uh, like I said, that is one thing that I do quite a lot. I know we didn't quite touch on that. But I do that a lot when uh, I am um, not in season, when I'm home. I give a lot of lessons. That's part of what I do for our pro shop business. Um, but yeah, I absolutely enjoy it. I love, you know, bringing people into this game, and and I work with all ages and all levels, from like people that have never bowled before in their life, and they're getting their very first bowling ball, to people that you know bowl regional and national for us. All right, excellent. And the final question comes from Jasmine watching on BowlTV.com. Who is the bigger Disney fan, Drew, Missy, or DJ? That's that's oh look at that nice question. Whoa, that's a hard one. <laughs> okay, so I would definitely say it's between me and DJ. <laughs> um, and I'm probably inch and saying me right now just because I'm older. Uh, but he's he's definitely a close second. I, I think that's been one of the hardest things is you know he's he's almost two and a half and he doesn't kind of he doesn't kind of get what's going on, which in some ways is really good. But for, I would say, a span of, I don't know, a month and a half, mm -hmm. every day he would wake up and he'd be like, go to Disneyland, because we have passes and I take them a lot. And he'd be like, go see Buzz at Disneyland, go see Mickey Mouse. And I'm like, buddy, Disneyland's closed. I'm sorry, we can't go. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're still definitely uh, watching lots of Disney movies. Currently, currently uh, we're on a Moana kick. Okay. Um, <laughs> but that's a close behind uh, Frozen and Toy Story. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, before we get to Aaron's question, I'm curious just on the Disney portion. Uh, and I know you've obviously been in a ton. You mentioned you have passes. So, and I've been once, and it was in um, what 2017, uh, I think it was with with Tennille. Um And so, when you how do you recreate or make your experience different kind of each time you you visit uh, so do you take one day to to you know kind of see this portion of the park and then maybe another day to see a different portion how do you kind of recreate or rework or re-enjoy if you will so i'll say the crazy thing is when you have a pass you don't have to go all day so you don't have to be like those people that pay a lot of money for one ticket mm -hmm. and have to go all day and you're just exhausted it is tiring. Like, I was not prepared for that. <laughs> no, it is a whole day. You will be tired. <laughs> but no, when you have a pass, like, before I had, before we had DJ, and Drew and I would just go, and we'd maybe go with a couple of friends or just go on our own, we might just go and go on a couple of rides, have lunch or have dinner, and then go home. Or during Christmas, I'll literally go during Christmas time. That's my favorite time of year. I will go just to look at the lights. We don't have to do anything. We can just watch the lights watch the fireworks show and I'm good. Like that's totally fine. Now I think it's awesome because it's kind of recreated with DJ mm -hmm. and we get to do all these new things through his eyes that we haven't been able to do for a really long time. So for a while it was just, okay, we're going to go and we're going to go ride the carousel or we're going to go on this ride in fantasy land. We're going to go on. It's a small world, you know? And now he's all about seeing the characters and like he wants to like legit run up to them and hug them. <laughs> like he freaks out, totally freaks out. And he loves the parades. He absolutely loves the parades. And uh, I'm very fortunate. So my sister and my brother-in-law are crazy talented and they both work for Disney and the entertainment side. So now we get to go watch uh, Aunt Cindy and Uncle Chris. Uh, in all of their shows and their parades that they do. And so that's just a whole other element for him that he gets to experience and he absolutely loves it. We took him to go see, there's a huge show. You guys probably 
aren't familiar, but there's a really big theater, like a Broadway sized theater, but even bigger uh, in California Adventure Theme Park. And right now they're doing a Frozen show. This show is 45 minutes. Like it is not a normal, you know, 15, 20 minute little show, mm -hmm. 45 minutes. And I took DJ when he had just barely turned two. And my brother-in-law, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but he plays Fen and, uh, and we were watching and, and my sister's like, hey, he's gonna do this today, why don't we go? I'm like, okay, but I don't think DJ's gonna be able to last 45 minutes and he's a two-year-old, come on, he's not gonna sit in a chair. He, <laughs> he was like a champ. He sat there and had his little snacks and he's just like, he was like <laughs> amazed amazed by all of it and he sat the whole time i thought for sure oh yeah we're gonna like last 15 minutes and we'll have to bounce and leave and it'll be fine but nope, he wasn't. so it's really cool to be able to experience all that stuff through his eyes now excellent mm -hmm. excellent uh thanks folks for all of your questions i uh, appreciate you all watching and now for the final question here is aaron smith and I think we'll know a few of the answers for this. But, uh, Missy, as we've been catching up with all the stars here on the PWBA Tour, we've always been asking what have been the binge watch recommendations. So uh, what's been uh, what's been on the tube at the park and household? So I will say I haven't really been binge watching that much. Um, we've been really busy doing other things. But I will say The Last Dance was incredible. Whoever did not check that out needs to check that out. Um, if you're any kind of sports fan whatsoever, you don't have to like basketball, you need to check that out. That was amazing. Uh, that's definitely a highlight. And other than that, I would say one of the shows randomly that we just started watching uh, is Jack Ryan. I think that's practical. Okay. So. <laughs> All right. A lot of, lot of bonus points for, for me uh, on the last dance. So. First person on this podcast to mention the last dance, so you, you get extra points from me. <laughs> That'll make up for the gauntlet, so now she wins the gauntlet. Sorry, Scott, yeah. you're off the show. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, Missy, nice, nicely done. Uh, Aaron, final thoughts? Uh, Missy, just a big thank you for uh, for joining us. You're, you know, we, we always love the opportunity to chat with you. Uh, love the opportunity to get to learn a little bit more about you here today. And, uh, I mean, after kind of hearing some of those things, I'm even more upset now that we're not going to have the tour because I really want to see you compete. So 2021, I'm going to be uh, going to be on the Missy Perkin uh, just watching bandwagon. So I'm going to be watching. I'm going to be watching you lead qualifying, making step ladder finals, winning shows, all that stuff. So Missy, thank you for sharing all that today. And uh, uh, yeah, it was awesome. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for having me. I really yeah. appreciate it. This was Absolutely. Awesome. It was, it was excellent. Uh, don't forget, folks, tomorrow, one of the shows that uh, we did talk about, the Sonoma County Open, that will be tomorrow's PWBA replay show. It'll be at uh, 4 p.m. Eastern on Bowl TV. So join us and uh, watch that, interact with some of the players uh, and the finalists in that show via the chat. So that's actually one of the coolest things about it. Uh, people like Missy will be in the chat players you can ask them questions what they were thinking in certain times in the matches etc so that's really cool um and then on wednesday our next pwba podcast will feature uh 2018 tour championship winner maria jose rodriguez uh we talked about the women's world championships with missy we will also have that conversation with maria who had a, just a phenomenal week uh during that time as well and uh, before we go missy one take wednesdays where can folks follow you and where should they watch uh, follow me on Instagram, uh, Missy underscore Parkin, uh, uh, on Instagram. And also I post it on my uh, Facebook fan page, Missy N Parkin. Uh, so if you check out either one of those channels, uh, I also will post sometimes on Twitter, Missy at Missy Parkin. So you can follow me on any of those channels, uh, but I will always be updating uh, my Instagram every Wednesday for one take with Missy Parkin. So be sure to check that out. I always do it Wednesday morning, so my time usually around 9, 10 a.m. before then. Uh, and then it'll automatically also pop up on my Facebook fan page. So check it out. Excellent. So that's what's coming up uh, PWBA-wise on Bold TV. Of course, tomorrow Inside the OC is back in business uh, with Matt Canazero and Daniel Fair. So be on the lookout for that. So for Aaron Smith, Missy Parkin, my name is Emil Williams Jr. And this has been episode 21 of the PWBA podcast. You watched it live and you listen right here on Bowl TV. Stay safe, folks.